Hey, we're so glad you're here. Thanks for joining us today. Yay! Hi, I'm Brittany Sweetie. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm Brittany Sweetie. I'm the marketing uh, manager at the Livestock Conservancy. And here with me today, we have the amazing Samantha Gasset and the awesome Jennifer Kendall. We're going to talk about branding. I can't wait. I've been looking forward to today. Sam, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? So my name is Samantha Gasson, and I work with the Food Animal Concerns Trust, which is a national organization that works with farmers who are, hum who are farming humanely. We provide um, all sorts of educational materials, and including a lot of webinars and all sorts of great things. Awesome. And Jennifer, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Excited to be here. Um, my name is Jennifer Kendall. I currently work for a company called Summer Discovery. Um, we do, we're an educational company, but um, in a previous life, I actually worked for the Livestock Conservancy. Um, so excited to be back and sharing knowledge today. All right. Welcome back. Woohoo. Uh, so <laughs> It's just so much fun to talk about marketing and branding and all that exciting stuff. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Anyway, if you didn't know by like today's marketing one. <laughs> um, I, used to always, I used to always hate marketing and branding until recently. So I'm now I'm excited about it. And I'm really looking forward to hear what Jen, hearing what Jennifer has to say. We have a convert. Yes. <laughs> Um, before we get started and we jump into all of the exciting questions today, if you've got a question, write it as a Facebook comment. We'd love to address it um, as we get into our discussion. Um, I'm also going to play this quick one minute video from our sponsor, Mana Pro. Thank you, Mana Pro, for sponsoring us today. We appreciate your support and helping us bring educational materials to everybody. Uh, so stick tight and we'll be right back. Champions. Colleagues, roommates, and personal trainers. <laughs> Whatever role they play, they're an important part of our lives. In their quiet way, and their not so quiet way. <laughs> they keep us young, on our feet, on the go. They pull us back to nature and push us toward the next adventure. <laughs> and as much as we count on them, they count on us all the more to nurture their lives with the same commitment. To protecting them, helping them grow, and thrive. Treating them as well as they treat us. <laughs> By giving them a little more of our lives. Because no matter what role they play, out here or in here, we're here to make their lives the best they can be. Manapro, Man nurturing life. life. Awesome. Welcome back. Thank you, Made a Pro, for supporting our heritage breed farmers and featuring them in, your, in our video. And uh, thank you for supporting this program. So as we get started, uh, Jennifer, what's your story? How did you get started with marketing and communications and branding? All that fun stuff. Yeah, um, good question. Um, I actually, growing up, I thought that I wanted to be a doctor. So I actually went to school to be a physical therapist and um, sort of kind of randomly found my way into the world of marketing. I um, I was working with a club at the time in college, the Red Cross Club, and we needed more people to give blood. There were events going on in the world at the time. There was a tsunami actually in Asia at the time, really impacting blood supplies internationally. And, and so I realized that marketing on campus could help us to reach really impactful goals, like getting more people to give blood or getting people to donate for disaster relief. And I found that really powerful. Um, and I also realized at that point that um, my skills were not in a lab. Not I didn't. I hated chemistry. I did like biology, um, but my strengths were really in writing and communicating. And so I switched to a journalism major um, and decided that I wanted to do marketing really for the rest of my life. And one of the things I've always been passionate about is doing it sort of for the greater good. Um, I don't believe in selling, not that there's anything wrong with selling widgets, but I like to use my skills for, you know, helping heritage breed farmers or earlier in my career, I did tourism marketing for like destinations. So helping counties to grow their tourism dollars. Um, I currently work in the education sector. So 
helping high schoolers find their passions, their universities of choice, and helping them to um, have experiences that will impact their future. So um, that's sort of how I fell into it. Um, a little bit of fun fact, I, I think Brittany may have mentioned, um, I actually used to work at the Livestock Conservancy. I think it's been about 10 years now. Um, and before that, I was in tourism marketing. So it was very interesting for me to bring sort of tourism marketing and, and the components of agritourism to potentially to heritage breed farmers. Um, but yeah, excited to be back, excited to be talking to you guys today. Like I said, I'm, I'm passionate about sharing knowledge for the greater good and very much about you know education, whatever that looks like. And today, I think that looks like helping farmers learn more about branding. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for bringing all of your skills and knowledge today. Um, if anybody has questions, go ahead and type them in as a Facebook comment. We'd love to get to those. Um, so we'll just start with the basics because sometimes people don't don't know what branding is. What it, What is branding and why is it important and why should people care? Yeah, I think that's that's the million dollar question, right? What is branding? Um, <laughs> and I think um, for a lot of us, including farmers, um, I think branding has can become a four letter word. Um, it feels <laughs> overwhelming. It feels um, uncomfortable. It feels like marketing jargon. And so I like to take a step back. I mean, when we think about it, the, the whole term brand actually comes from the agricultural industry, from literally branding your animals, you know, when there was open range. Um, so the actual idea of branding actually comes interestingly from agriculture. Um, and I think a lot of times when people think about brand, this is true for me as well when I was first learning about branding is, you think about logos, right? You think about a logo pops in your head. Oh, I got to create a logo. And while logos are a piece of branding, I think stepping back, the key thing about a brand is it's how people think of you or your product or your farm or whatever it is you are offering, your knowledge, whatever it is. It's what they think of you. You know, it's the idea or the image that's coming to their head when you say X farm or heritage livestock, what is coming to their head when, when you say that? Um, so I'm sure I could list off a ton of brands and, you know, I'm looking around my office. I've got a Subway cup here. I've got an Apple phone, which I just converted to being an Apple person after like 15 years pulled out. You know, I've got, you know, UNC up here on my wall. Um, so all of those are, are brands. And when you hear me say those words, you probably immediately thought, oh yeah, I like Subway or I don't like Subway or UNC. Oh, they have a good basketball team or Apple. Oh, I really like their products. Or I really hate their products. And so the big, the big thing is that brands elicit ideas and emotions. Um, and so it's not so much about a logo or creating a logo or a business card. It's more about what is the feeling that people have when they think about you or your farm or your products or the breeds that you're raising. Um, and so that's what I, I like to take a step back. It's not about logos. It's not about colors. It's not about fonts. It's about a feeling. Um, and another thing I, I like to tell people is there is no one thing. You know, your brand is a sum of everything that you do. It is honestly, it's the, you know, it's the car that you're driving to the farmer's market, you know, is that, that gives a message about you. Are you driving, you know, a truck that's an F-150? Are you driving a fuel efficient vehicle? Like, what does that say about your values? Um, it's, it's how you, it's how you answer the phone when your customers call you. Are you like, hey, I'm busy. I got to call you back. Are you like, hey, you know, I'm busy. Can I call you back in an hour? You know, it's, it's all about how you, how you are perceived in the world. Um, and then I think one thing to keep in mind for farmers, and this is both, I think, a good thing and can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming, is your brand is oftentimes very much tied to who you are as a person. Um, so your personal values, you know, your personal story, why you got into farming, why you chose heritage breeds, why you chose this breed over another breed. Um, so I think on some level, branding, especially when it comes to farms, can feel a little, um, make you feel a little vulnerable, honestly, because you're having to really put yourself out there as a, a human being. Um, and so for some people, myself included, that's not always comfortable. You know, this is what I value. This is 
why I do what I do. Um, for some people that's very comfortable, but for, and, and this is normal for a lot of people, it's not um, a comfortable experience to have to put yourself out there and be very vulnerable with who you are. Um, looks like I was just looking at the chat over here, um, branding that freezer hot branding and maybe look tattoos. Um, Hi, Gabrielle. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah, Gabrielle uh, said she's been looking forward to this. She thought this chat was about branding, meaning um, freezer hot branding and maybe lip tattoos. And and Jennifer just talked about how that was, you know, the origin of, of the weird branding. <laughs> comes from that. Thank you, Gabby. <laughs> Jennifer, I think you... Jennifer, I think you hit on something really, um, really key is that sort of vulnerability that you end up. I, that's what it was always, I think, where, where I hated the idea of marketing and branding was because there is a certain amount of vulnerability that you have to you have to put yourself out there. Um, and that can be really awkward because I think a lot of farmers are very private people, basically very private people. And, and then you're putting this position where you're you're everything in your business. And um, and that includes being an ambassador for your business. And that's scary. And certainly I battled that for a really long time. And I did not do my logo for my farm. Up in, uh, so we've been selling for like 11 or 12 years, something like that. And I didn't do my logo until maybe four years ago because I just couldn't, I couldn't find something that I felt like really represented who I was, whereas now I have something and I'm, I'm pretty happy with it, but it took me a long time to get there. So um, I definitely hear what you're saying. I think a lot of, a lot of people hear what you're would understand where you're coming from on that. Yeah. And a hundred percent, I think um, one of the challenges too, is just the sheer branding always can't be at the forefront from a farmer, especially when you, you've got animals to feed or, tractors to fix or farmers markets to attend. Um, branding is not something that is always going to take front seat. Um, but I think it is super important. I think one of the questions that, you know, kind of the second half of the question was, why is it important? Um, you know, I think it can make a difference in how much quantity of product you're selling. It can make a difference. You know, I think the key is to ask yourself, you know, what are you hoping to do? How are you hoping to grow as a farm? Is that you want to do more tourism on your farm? Is it you want to sell more products? Is it you want to become a breeding stock supplier? I don't, I don't know what the goal is, um, but I think that branding and marketing can really help you to get further towards whatever those goals are, whether it's growth, whether it's expansion, whether it's selling to restaurants, um, branding is a way that um, all of those goals are going to be helped to be realized. Um, but like you said, I think for a number of reasons, it's oftentimes an uncomfortable thing for farmers. I know when I worked at the Livestock Conservancy um, in working with farmers, it was always kind of an uncomfortable position they felt put in to kind of have to be vulnerable and tell their story. Um, and we can chat later. There are some other kind of ways you could think about going about branding your farm or your operation, your business, where maybe you aren't the face of it. So we can talk about how you might could get creative in that right. Perfect. That's awesome. Yeah, I always think of it as the experience and building those relationships and how people can think about you. So I think that's awesome. So this this year, we're trying to focus on building our audience and building our online audience. So how can branding kind of help you build that audience? What are some some ways that it could help you? Yeah, so I mean, I think a big part of, you know, the big part of branding is, you know, what is your message? Who are you? Um, you know, how can people find you? It's all of those different components that come together and make your quote brand. Um, and so when it comes to, you know, when I work with small businesses or farmers, um, kind of the, the low hanging fruit, as I call it, when building kind of your brand or your online presence, um, I like to start with kind of two places. And that is if you are, a, I would say, a location that is comfortable being found online. In other words, you're comfortable with people knowing where your address is. Um, I always suggest people manage their what's called your Google My Listing, Google My Business Listing. So essentially, businesses, when you go on your phone or your computer and you say, I want to find, you know, find 
farms near me or find um, grocery stores near me or find gas stations near me. Google will pull up based on your location um, businesses near you. Um, and so I always encourage people to um, get access really or start their Google My Business listing, um, which is where you claim, yes, I own this farm. Um, yes, I want to control this listing, meaning that you can update the hours and you can update the phone number. It's as simple as they send a postcard to the address that you say that you <laughs> that you own. And once you verify it, you can control that listing, right? So you can add information, you can add hours of operation, you can add telephone numbers, you can add website links. Um, so I always say that's a great tool, especially for small businesses and local businesses, because it's cheap, it's easy, and it's, um, you know, Google prioritizes that in terms of, you know, anybody searching farms nearby or local eggs or whatever, um, it's going to, you're going to pop up on that. So it's, it's really free advertising for you and it's basically cost you nothing. Um, so that's one tip I always give to small businesses as kind of a, a starting spot. Again, I will say I'm aware that some farmers may not want, you know, for security reasons or biosecurity reasons, they may not want um, that address information out there. And that's totally fine too. Like, I think it's definitely a personal choice based on what your farm goals are. If you're looking to be a tourist destination, highly recommend you being on Google My Business. If you're looking to sell breeding stock and, you know, the average person isn't going to be Googling, where can I find, you know, breeding stock for X heritage breed nearby, um, then, you know, maybe you think twice about, do I really need to list this, you know, on Google? So again, it's all about your goals. Um, the second thing I usually, when working with small businesses or farmers, and I know this is a, a slippery slope, but um, social media is by far, I would say the easiest in terms of um, barrier to entry. So there's not a lot of um, money or time involved with signing up for a social media account, setting up a social media platform. Um, there, as Brittany knows, there's huge time involved or can be huge time involved. It's what you make it, right? It's, it's all what you make it. And so I always recommend that um, small businesses, farmers kind of look into social media. If you can't afford or if you're not sure if you want to go the website route right now, I say get a Facebook account. So some work I've done on the side, you know, I've worked with people and been like, you know what, we don't have time to set up. It might take us six months to a year to set up a website. Let's get a Facebook page up and running. Let's put some weekly content on the Facebook page, start getting people interested. And then what we actually did was we took our Google My Business account and pointed it to the Facebook page instead of a website. So I think social media can be a great way to build your online audience, but I will put that with the caveat that it can be as big or as small as you want it to be. It can be a daily thing where you're feeling compelled to post content daily. It can be weekly. Um, but I, one thing I do caution people about is if you, if you are going to start a social media presence to help build your brand, I do think you need to commit some time to it, whether that's a once a week posting, um, you know, saying once a month, maybe you might could get by with that. But realistically, if you're if you're looking to engage your audience and really build your audience, I would say a minimum of once a week, really probably at least two to three times a week would be ideal. Um, so Jennifer, Jennifer, I have a question oh. for you. Oh, sorry. I put my hand up like I'm in school. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Jennifer, I'm getting too used to Zoom. I'm used to, I, I'm acting like I'm in person here. Um, sorry, Jennifer. So uh, so what, what, what are the benefits to Facebook over Instagram? Or should you do both? Or, you know, should you link your Instagram to your Facebook? Um, what, be, what are your thoughts on that? And I'm actually taking notes, just so you know, with everybody else. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I think Brittany has a ton of experience here as well and has some probably some great tips as well. But I think it's what's manageable for you. Right. So I myself am trying to start a small business and it feels overwhelming to think about managing three different social media accounts, to be honest. So I think you have to be really honest with yourself about what can I commit to um, to get started. And the other thing is, I think sometimes we fear um 
failure. So we, we put off getting started. So pick one thing. Can I pick one channel to do well? Can I do it once a week? Right. Start set the bar low. Um, but yeah, so good, good question. Um, generally Facebook is going to be skew a little bit older in terms of demographics. Um, you're going to see probably, I would say 30 to 50, 60 year olds, probably more so on Facebook. You're going to see younger generations more so on Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok or some of the newer platforms. And so one of the big questions I would have for you would be where, where is your target audience? Are they, you know, most of the time, I would say the people that are interested in this sort of concept are going to be probably 30 ish and above. That's not, that's not a hard and fast rule, but um, that's why I tend to think that Facebook is, a good starter channel for a lot of farmers. Um, I also think that, well, I don't think that Facebook is the largest in terms of reach, in terms of people using it. Um, so you have more potential to reach more people through Facebook. Um, but that's not to say that like Instagram is also, I think a great option. The thing I love about Instagram is yes, it's going to skew a little bit younger. So your average age on Instagram is going to be a little bit younger of a consumer. Um, but I actually think that can be great in some circumstances. If you're trying to push educational content, if you're trying to push, um, if you're doing agritourism and wanting, you know, a younger demographic maybe to come out to your farm or young parents. So I think it depends on what your business goals are. Um, Instagram is great though, because it's so visual, right? And I think so much of farming is so visual that you know you could snap pictures all day and post them on instagram and do a simple little you know check out this chicken or you know here's joey the donkey and people will get really excited about that because people like seeing animals they like seeing authentic content so again i don't think there's a hard and fast rule i can tell you what marketers will tell you but i think it's a, a whole different story when you are having to do this on your own or maybe with little support and you've got to navigate the waters yourself. So, um, yeah. you know, a marketer would say go on every channel and do everything, you know, but real, <laughs> from a realistic standpoint, I would say pick one, experiment with it, get comfortable with it. Um, as far as linking the two channels, I would say when you're getting started, if you want to link the two channels, meaning that, when you post on Facebook, it automatically posts to Instagram or vice versa. I think that's fine when you're starting out, especially if you're like, I can't manage both of them. I just want, you know, to have a presence on one and it fill the content to the other. I think that's perfectly fine. Um, again, the marketing side of me would say, no, you're supposed to have special strategies for each channel. But the practical side of me says, start that way and see how it works and if it works great if it doesn't work you can pivot um so yeah great questions yes social media is very important it can also suck up all of your time <laughs> if you let it so can... this, my, daughter, my daughter was visiting um she came and she she made dog treats for a couple of days because we take we take our offal from our hogs and we make dog treats out of them and so she came and did she helped me with that for a couple of days and um she's been getting on me about the instagram reels and i they stress me out so much <laughs> i just find the whole thing it's just like just can things just stay the same for a while can why are we like <laughs> Just stick with one thing and stop changing. <laughs> it's so hard. So anyway, so now I've been guilted into doing reels and I've done five total so far and I'm feeling very proud of myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah. thing about social. It's always changing. <laughs> yes, I was going to say it's we feel the same way. Like when I log in, it seems like something is different every single day. I have to learn a new tool every day. Um, so I can imagine the compounding effect of a farmer having to, you know, run their actual farm business on one side, but then have to do marketing, you know, the other side, I, you know, we feel it too. So we're all sharing the pain of technology changing <laughs> at a pace that's, you know, hard to keep up with. Absolutely. Jennifer, do you want to take some questions from the audience? Let's see. Wendy says, hi, Wendy. Thanks for joining us today. Wendy says, Yelp offers a free general listing for businesses also. So 
that's also helpful. Yeah, that's I like, would say um, that's hugely important too, is that um, Yelp, Google, any of these are going to allow you also to get reviews potentially, which can um, also be a huge um, selling point or value add for your business. So that's an awesome tip as well that Yelp basically does the same thing as Google in terms of a business listing. Thanks for that tip, Wendy. Let's see. Gabrielle also says, tough to figure out how to promote. I think it's your the value. The value of your product when similar items are available at Michael's for a fraction of the price. Uh, Gabby does felting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, you're not gonna find you're not gonna find pork chops at Michael's. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome to have the clarification. I think this is hugely important. I think this ties back to why branding is so important. Um, yes, the cost conscious consumer who is only motivated by price is going to say, yep, I'll go get it at Michael's because that's what they care about, right? They care about price is their ultimate value. But I think what you have to realize is there are a lot of consumers out there that care about other things. They care about you know, when they buy something, is it doing something good for the earth? Or am I helping to support a small business? Or, you know, is this, you know, something I want to put inside of my child's body if it's food or, or whatever, or my body? And so, yes, it is true that definitely there are consumers out there that are motivated by price and they're going to go to Michael's or get the two for one deal or whatever they can get to save money. But I think there is also a whole other segment of consumer that is motivated by by values, by um, the greater good. And I think that's huge. So that's, when we talk about branding, a big piece of that is, you know, what is your farm value? Why did you start your farm? Why, you know, what are the values of your farm? What is your farm providing for the greater good for the next generation? And if you can start figuring out how to articulate those things, if you can start figuring out how to say, you know what, yes, my, you know, my blankets or whatever it is, they may cost, $50 and you can get one for 20 at Michael's. But when you buy mine, you're helping to, you know, give the next generation of livestock a chance so that we can save the future of genetics of agriculture, right? So it's all about how you position your, your products, your farm, your story. Um, and yes, you are 100% right that there are consumers that are completely price motivated. But I will, I will tell you a lot of consumers, and especially we're seeing this a lot with younger consumers that are coming up, um, I would say around, you know, 20s to 30s, they're very, um, very much more aware of how their purchasing habits are, you know, doing something for the greater good. So, you know, is it helping the earth? Is it giving shoes to an orphan in Somalia? Um, and you would be surprised actually how many um, consumers fall into that category. So yes, definitely um, something to think about in terms of price and, and price and positioning. But again, I think that's a, a, a huge um, perk to branding is that you can really help to sell that value. You know, it's not just about the product, it's about everything that goes with that product. So Jennifer, I just found, I think you're, somebody gave me some great advice at one point. I can't remember who it was now or else I give them credit for it, but it was that not everybody is your customer and that's okay. And it, it was actually um, talking about CSAs and subscription kind of things that you might have with your farm. Um, and that it's much better, you don't want to try and convince people to do something that they don't want to do. So you, you're, you're better off trying to find um, the, the right people, the people who are going to buy into your story, who are going to buy into, it was a subscription, it was what we were talking about. So if people are willing to buy into that, then there's there's more value in that. So you, you, I think marketing, you always sort of have this idea in your head, or I always used to, it's just like you're trying to convince people to buy something they don't necessarily want to buy. And that's not what marketing is. Now that I've learned more about marketing, marketing is more about getting people the things that they want um, or maybe they didn't know that they wanted, but that they do want. So you're not trying to fool somebody into doing something they don't want to do. So like Jennifer said, the person who wants to go to Michael's and doesn't see value in, you know, something that's handmade in, you know, the, the U.S. with your heritage breeds of sheep or whatever fiber you're using, um, then they're not your they're not your customers. And so you're not going to market to them. Right. And that's the value of knowing your audience. And, and that's, you know, that's good. <laughs> yeah. 
I yeah. think we had a question earlier that kind of goes along with what we're talking about. Uh, why is crafting your farm story important? It's kind of like your elevator pitch. Um, it's, you know, we're not in sales. We're pretty marketing. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, I think this is a great question. I think this is sort of what all of our branding conversations kind of earlier have led to is, especially for farmers, you know, so much of marketing for the farm is really tied into you, right? It's into how did the farm get started? Why did you choose the breeds? Why did you choose the product? Um, you know, what's your family's history with this? What's your history? Um, so it, so much of the farm story is really interlaced and interwoven with sort of your story, your experience. Um, but that is huge. Like people, people like a story, right? People want to buy into the story. That's why we grow up and we're reading bedtime stories and, and we love that as children, right? We, we um, seek sort of that story, that history, that picture. Um, so crafting the farm story is hugely important. And I would say it, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty much the, the essence of your brand, right? Um, what do you value and why? Um, transparency, I think is hugely important. The other thing I think is critically important is authenticity. Um, I think especially for farmers, and, and this again is can be uncomfortable sometimes, but I think it's important for you to feel like you can show up and be your authentic self and share your authentic values because ultimately that's going to come through, right? If, if someone goes to the farmer's market and they've seen your website and it says one thing, but then they go to the farmer's market and they meet you and it's a completely different experience, then that can be jarring, right? And they're like, there's a big disconnect between the two. Um, so it's, it's hugely important, I would say, to kind of have that farm story, to have that, you know, who I am I? Why did I start my farm? Why did I choose, you know, the products, breeds, whatever that I have? Um, because that is so much of the value proposition, the value of, of why buy my products or why visit my farm. Um, so, yeah, it's hugely important. Um, when thinking about, you know, how do I create my brand story? I would just sit down and start thinking, you know, jotting down, you know, what's important to me? What are my values? Why did I, why did I start this farm in the first place? Like, what was I trying to achieve? Um, you know, I would say, what do you know, ask yourself, what's your goal? Like, what am I trying to do ultimately? Not like raise more chickens or, you know, make a living off of this. Like, what is your why? Like, what is your kernel inside of you? That's like, this is why I get up every morning and, you know, for Brittany, why do you get up and take your duck to the vet to see if he you know, <laughs> needs to stay in the bathroom for three weeks and take medicine? Like, you know, there is something inside of you that's driving you to, to want to do that. And so that's kind of what we have to tease out as farmers and as marketers. It's like, what is that core kernel of truth that is driving you to do, to, to be a farmer? Um, and how do you communicate that to somebody? I think the harder part is how do I communicate that, right? Because sometimes you're like, God, they're going to think I'm crazy when I'm like, I want to change the world by, you know, one chicken <laughs> at a time. But you know what? There's a lot of aspiration and um, excitement about I want to change the world one chicken at a time, you know? Um, there is a, there is like a huge, um, kind of like to what you said, Sam, there's a huge, you know, not everyone's going to resonate with that. That's not going to resonate with everyone, but there is a core audience that that's going to resonate with and that they're going to feel very motivated and compelled by that. Um, so again, authenticity, asking yourself what you value. I also think being comfortable with your farm story changing over time, right? We're people, we evolve over time. <clears throat> Our why might be evolving. We may still be figuring out where we're going or is this the product for me? And so I think being comfortable saying, you know what, my farm story may evolve just like I do over time <coughs> and owning that and being comfortable really with changing. <coughs> so that's, that's a good point, Jennifer, because this just came up recently for me. Our farmer's market manager at our farmer's market sent out something to all of the vendors saying, hey, go to, go to the farm, the, the market's website and make sure your little, you know, blurb about your farm is still the same. And I went there and I realized that the little blurb I've had on the, <laughs> on the market page is from like 2012. And it's <laughs> so different from what I'm doing now. So I had to go back and rewrite it. And 
hadn't even thought about that going back and making sure that um that not just not just I've changed my story, but I haven't changed it everywhere that people seek me out. And so I hadn't thought about that, even doing that. You know, you do it on your website or whatever, but it's um, hard to remember all the other places. But anyway, but that that came up, just how much you can change over time. And it's okay, it's okay to change. Just have to make sure you update. <laughs> you keep a list of all those places. So your Yelp and your Google and your marketplace and have a little spreadsheet and you're like, go through and change. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I think you touch on something hugely important is that brands are always like reinventing themselves, like the whole Facebook meta, whatever that is, not going to question that, you know, you know, brands are constantly like, how do we change? How do we evolve? And so it's 100% normal and 100% okay if over time your brand story is changing, your farm story is changing, your values may be changing over time that's normal and you should embrace it and make sure, like you said, just make sure that you're, as that's changing and as you're updating your website, that you're also updating other pieces of marketing. <laughs> yeah, I have been doing a whole bunch of stuff I don't do anymore. <laughs> it's a little crazy. So Jennifer, how, um, so when you when you go to write your mission statements or um, I guess that's more if you're writing a business plan or something, but if you've got in your mind what your business state, your uh, mission statement is, how is that going to differ from your story? Or are they going to be very similar? Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to be very similar. I personally, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but I personally am not a fan of mission statements. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of values, of um, goals. But, you know, I think ultimately, I would say start with your values. That, that's where I always start. You know, why? What do I value? What do I bring to the world? And then from that, figure out your mission statement. I always actually say write your mission statement last. I think most people start with your mission statement first. Um, but I think sometimes it, it requires thinking through what do you value? What do you, where are we going? What are we going to sell? Um, what is my farm story? I think a lot of that thinking can help to trigger thoughts around what your mission statement should be. So again, I wouldn't get too caught up in just like with logos, we can get caught up in logos, right? Everyone loves logos, I think, because they're visual, but same with the mission statement. You can get very caught up in the mission statement, you know, wordsmithing it, getting it just right. Um, but I would I'd say take a step back and think more about what do I value? What do I want for my farm? What is my farm providing to the world? Is it, you know, food? Is it, you know, a chance at a future? Is it education? Is it, you know, peace and tranquility through interaction with farm animals? Um, figure out what it is you value and what your farm delivers to the customer and then worry about writing your mission statement. Again, that mission statement also, like, it's going to change over time. That's a big thing I see for all organizations is, like, they change scope and they change direction, but they forget to come back and update the mission statement. Um, so even where I work now, we need to change our mission statement. So I'm like, guys, I'm not even going to tell you what our mission statement is because it's, it's not right. You know, we've changed, we've changed course. Um, let's focus on who we are and less on, like, this lofty, here's what I want to be. That's great. Mm -hmm. So um, what are some helpful resources people can use as they're starting to think about their story and branding and where can they go? Yeah, um, I think there's an, I think there's a lot of ways you can go about this. I think, um, I think Sam has hit some of something at the, I think she's hit some of them on the head, you know, Farmers markets can be a great place to get idea ideas. I think um, local agricultural, you know, experts, whether that's through extension or other, you know, organizations you may be involved in locally. I think those are great resources. Honestly, just to talk to other farmers to see what they're doing. Um, one of the biggest things, I mean, it, sh it should be no secret, but one of the biggest things we do in marketing is we look at competitors. Um, and I don't think you should necessarily think of it as a competitor, but maybe someone else in your industry that's doing something similar or something you like, um, check them out, like go to their website, see what they're doing, ask if they'll have yeah. lunch with you if they're local um, or Zoom or whatever you feel comfortable with these days. Um, but I would definitely say 
you know, looking at other people who are doing what you're doing and learning from them is huge, um, especially sort of in the farm arena where things are, I would say, a little bit different. Like you're not selling um, a traditional product, so to speak, that you're going to go find at Walmart. And so learning from learning from your competitors slash friends is a great way, a great tool. Um, I would say any sort of um, a lot of agricultural magazines like Grit, Mother of News, et cetera, oftentimes have blog topics and things like that on marketing. I, I would say Google search and see um, if you can find some reputable sources. A lot of actually extension websites have a lot of materials on marketing. So again, Googling. Um, other resources, um, you know, I think that um, kind of when you're trying to figure out your brand story, again, um, going back to less about like what is my brand and more about who am I as a person, what do I value? So even things like working through your own um, value statement or values assessment. You, again, you can do all of those online, just like Google it, and it'll be like, here's the step, you know, answer these seven questions. What do you value? Why did you start? You know, why did you pick this path for yourself, et cetera? Um, I think that can be a huge resource for just kind of helping you frame in your mind, you know, what is your story? Why did I get started? How did I get started? Um, you know, the internet is going to be your friend, honestly, um, in terms of blogs, in terms of content. Um, as far as direct resources, I mean, there's tons of, Brittany, I, I bet you guys probably have a list of free resources, marketing resources of some sort for farmers, but, you know, there are um, all sorts of free tools out there in terms of social media management, uh, graphic editing, video production. You know, I think that's something that um, you could probably also Google, but there's tons of free things. We all, we all like free things. I know <laughs> um, Brittany and I came from the education yeah. side where we also had low budgets and we very much were a fan of like free everything. So I'm, I'm sure um, there are probably lists out there where you can Google <laughs> free, free, you know, social media content creation help, and it will give you all kinds of apps or tools that you can use. Yeah, okay, so that's a great resource. <laughs> the Food Animal Concerns Trust has a lot of webinars and they archive um, the webinars, but right now our website's sort of messed up, so don't look today. <laughs> Maybe look at a week. It's all messed up, but there's a whole bunch of uh, webinars um, directly related to social media and uh, marketing in general. And I think we need to have another webinar with Jennifer because she's amazing. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and also, and um, we do have one coming up. Um, I think it's which is a it's a very much a basic how to with social media um, with Paige Jackson of Grass Graze Farm, which is um, just down the road from us. Yeah, I know we love Paige. So we're going to be doing um, that, and then Paige is also going to be uh, with us sometime in the summer with uh, with Brittany and I on Marketing Mondays, um, talking about something similar. So just that very much. She's literally going to say, "Take out your phone." This is how you do this. <laughs> this is how you do that, you know? So for those of us who are maybe are a little social media impaired, <laughs> I consider myself. No, know, that's good. It's good to break it down because when you look at it as all one big thing, it can get super overwhelming and you're just like, I don't have enough hours in the day to deal with all of this. <laughs> but if you break it down into chunks, like, today I'm going to figure out Facebook, like I'm going to do this step and then yeah. this step and then this step, then it's, you know, much more manageable. Then you're like, I gotta have a website and I gotta have Facebook and I gotta have Instagram. I gotta have a brand story. I gotta figure out who I am. And now I gotta figure out all of this. Like, <laughs> But no, it's, we're here for you. It's okay. Honestly, I feel like the hardest, uh, hardest part of all of it is keeping up with all the dang passwords. Like, I don't know if you guys feel yes. like this, but <laughs> It's like there's a password for every tool, device, social media thing. And I'm constantly saying I forgot my password and then I have mm -hmm. to reset it and then I have to reset it on multiple devices. So if someone comes up with an awesome way to like securely store all the passwords, which I know there's apps out there, but I don't know if I trust them, then that that's where it's at. I use a, I use one called LastPass and it like keeps it? track of all of your passwords and you just have to click and then it'll go automatically. So so LastPass 
Um, I, I yes, our markets um, when uh, our farmers market uses LastPass for all of its passwords, and our one of our previous presidents, she had LastPass for her personal use, and sometimes she would save stuff on the um, on the on the uh, man, on the uh, markets LastPass account. So at one point, I went through and I cleaned it all, all out. I knew what kind of underwear she bought. I knew like all this. Well, that brings up a very like, important point. Um, please keep your business and your personal separate. <laughs> so if you're going to get into LastPass, make sure that if you've got a, a, a one through your company or whatever that uh, other people see, that you don't save your underwear <laughs> where you order your underwear from. <laughs> Poor Hannah. I shouldn't tell her secret. <laughs> well, now they know who it is. <laughs> Well, okay. Sorry. I didn't say Hannah. I said Joan. Joan. <laughs> All right. Too much information. Sorry. That's okay. We're here for sharing and moral support, you know. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Jennifer, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> Uh, let's see if anybody has last minute questions before we wind up, uh, please uh, put them in the chat. Thank you to everybody who has already chatted at us um, while we wait. Let's see. I think we've got one more question here. Um, so if we've got our story, we've got our social media and our website, kind of like what's the next step for people if they're thinking like, I got this. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, you know, the first thing, the first step I would take after social media, if you don't have one already, would be website. I think that's, um, and our web-driven universe websites are critical. Um, the reason I don't people to, don't tell people to start there is because sometimes that can be overwhelming. It can feel like a daunting task. So the easiest way to get online sometimes is social media and then worry about the website. Um, but there's a lot, there's lots of like tools like Wix and there's all kinds of different Squarespace and is it Squarespace? I think it is um, that you can kind of drag and drop and create websites. So um, again, that would be sort of my point number three would be websites. Um, and I, I would say if you don't have, you know, someone to help code a website or create one, those are great tools, free tool. Well, depending on what level they can be free or paid. Um, the other thing I, I say as kind of a next step is starting to create an email distribution list. Um, and this this is where you start kind of, I would say, getting into the next level marketing. But, you know, you have customers, you want to communicate with them. Are you collecting their email addresses or phone numbers or some way that you can communicate with them? Um, and if you're not quite ready to start sending out newsletters and things like that, you can always start collecting the information. And then, you know, if it takes you three months, six months, a year, at least you're still collecting the information so that at the time when you are ready to, maybe it's a monthly newsletter or maybe it's a, you're going to email out, you know, if you're going to be at the market the next day, you're going to send an email letting them know what you're going to be bringing. Um, so I, I, I like to think that a next step after you kind of figured out the website would be moving into sort of email marketing um, or customer marketing. That could be phone. It could be email. It could be, you know, direct mail. If you want to send them Christmas cards to your customers. Um, but it's always good to kind of have a way to communicate directly with your customers. Um, and from there, I would say um, content. So, you know, if you're interested in producing blogs or if you are, um, working on creating content for your website. So basically building more content around your brand and your farm. So whether that's blog posts or adding pages to your website about your history or about us or your values. Um, so good content goes a long way. That's going to help you um, from a number of different ways, but a big way that will help you is from search engine marketing. So Google likes content. So the more you are starting to think about good content or blogs, um, sometimes the more you can reach Google and constituents on Google. Again, that's not that's not going to be critical for everyone, right? Like, if you're not selling nationally, or if you're if you have a very 
finite amount of product that you need to move, then Google and gaming Google is probably not like the best step for you. Like you could probably stick to local markets. You could look for avenues through your local markets. Um, so I think it really sort of depends on what your goals are, how big you want to go, how big you want to scale. Um, but I would say those are some kind of key next steps would be kind of your email list development or whether it's direct mail or text or however you want to communicate. Um, and then kind of moving into content, you know, is it blogs? Is it pages on your website? Um, because people love good content. So Jennifer, one thing I got this great advice, actually it was from Paige with Grass Grace Farm, who's going to be on next month uh, or whenever, no, sorry, this summer sometime. Um, but um, she recommended uh, that I take my, whatever content you write in your newsletter, that then that can, you have sort of like your story for the week, whether it's your newsletter story or your blog or whatever, or your social media, and it's it's all tied in together. So you're not making, you're not doing a separate story for, for Instagram, then a, a, a something else for your blog, and then something else for your newsletter, that they're all sort of tied together. So I, when I do my newsletter, which by the way, I, I collected uh, emails for 12 years before I finally <laughs> used them. That might be a little extreme, but I knew at some point I was going to start a newsletter and I did two years ago. Um, but that's what I do. I take my newsletter and if it's blog worthy, then I'll put it up on my blog. Um, is that, can you think of, is that, a, is that good advice or is that, are you just, are you recycling information that maybe you should be doing new content with the different, with your different uh, platforms? No, a hundred percent support that idea. So um, as Brittany's probably learned, I, or I hope we've taught one another is that create it once and blast it everywhere. So, you know, you yep. don't know how someone's going to consume that content. You know, is someone going to see it through social media? Is someone going to happen to read their email? nine times out of 10, someone has to see something two, three, four, five times before they actually like register. Like, oh yeah, I read this. How many is it? Seven? Um, seven, at least seven yeah. times. <laughs> so like for us, it feels like, man, I've told that story, you know, a lot of yeah. places. This time. <laughs> but for the consumer, they may only see that one time. Um, so we're a big right. fan of creating something once and then figuring out all the different ways you could leverage that. Can I leverage this on social media? Can I leverage this on my newsletter? Can I make a flyer out of this? Can I make a blog out of this? You know, how can I make the least work possible? But also if it's good content, like there's no reason not to share it in many different places. You never know how people are interacting. Like some people prefer email, some people prefer to check social media. So we are definitely fans of, taking that content and publishing it to as many mediums as possible. Oh yes. Repackage, 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 repackage. Like you can make three different posts out of it, you know, across all your platforms and then your email and your website and then make it into SEO on your website. Yeah. Just less content, more places. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Less work. Yes. Work smarter, not harder. <laughs> like, Give yourself some time and sanity because you only have so much time in the day to create and be creative. So, you know, get that big idea and then repurpose it across all your platforms, no matter what that is. Because um, good content is good content. So, I think we have one more question. Let's see. Hi, Rhonda. Thanks for joining us today. We're so glad you're here. Rhonda says, What sources are people using for a free and simple web page? So yeah. I'm using Wix for mine. Yeah, I'm curious what people, uh, I'm curious if anybody else will chime in. But yeah, Wix is a great one. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the last time I used it, it was pretty drag and drop and pretty simple to use. Um, I think, like I said, Squarespace, honestly, you could probably Google and there's probably at least 10 of them that'll come up for you in terms of easy to use and simple. Um, I always think those are great tools as to get started. Um, you know, they're, they're pretty easy to use, pretty easy to navigate. Um, and I, um, someone said GoDaddy is very easy. Um, I haven't played with GoDaddy's actual editor yet, but um, I have seen where they offer that service now. So that's, that's cool as well. You can buy your domain and start your website. 
Absolutely. Great question. Thanks, Rhonda. And if you're curious there about more, market. go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Sam. No, 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 you go ahead. You go ahead. I was just going to plug our um, chat from last month with Andrew about websites. Um, it's on YouTube. It's on our website. I can post the link. So yeah, if you were, were interested in more website stuff, we please go back and watch that. And if you're interested in all the email marketing, thanks for that awesome segue. That's what we're talking about next month. Get excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, the, yeah so go the, the wix the, i started out with the free version but then i had too many photos so i had to upgrade uh but i i did the free version for gosh probably about five or six years and it was so easy and like jennifer said it's click and drag it's for people who don't know anything it's so easy but i think squarespace is like that and i know that our farmers market uses godaddy and that's been that I think that was pretty easy to set up as well. Yeah. And also, you know, one tool I've started using recently, I don't know if anyone else has used it, is um, there's a site called Upwork where you can basically um, hire freelancers for basically you set the price. Um, you can say, I need somebody to create a farm website. You know, I'm looking to pay X per hour or X for the full project. And you can basically see their credentials, see their ratings. Um, I found that actually pretty helpful with um, some projects I've bid out for the company I work for. Um, and it's been very cost effective in terms of like getting people who are quality to, to do short projects like build a website or create an email template or whatever it is. So um, I would say look for freelancers if you're completely strapped and you're like, I don't have time to do this. Freelancing might, um, might be the way to go or you know maybe in your local community maybe at the community college or um if you know people nearby that also might be a way to go you know see if someone's interested in, in helping you out for maybe in exchange for product or something like that yeah absolutely that's a great idea <clears throat> well it looks like our hour is winding down and so i already started to shamelessly plug a few things. Sam, did you have anything you wanted to plug this week? I do. So um, I have a, a, I have a farm, which I think has been made clear already. <laughs> it's called Bull City Farm. Oh, thank you, Brandy. <laughs> That's my website. Um, but then also I'm, I'm on social media, but I'm really bad at it. So you can, I don't know, <laughs> give me some love over there or something. Give me some you ideas. very cute <laughs> pictures on your Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but also FACT has a couple of webinars coming up. There's one um, coming up tonight at five o'clock that's about the avian flu and the, the strain that is currently in the U.S. Um, if you're in the southern part of the U.S. or anywhere near um, the East Coast, that's probably already been sent out to you, all that kind of information. But we've got um, the uh, executive director of a, uh, the it's APPPA, the American Pastured Poultry Producers Association. He, uh, Mike Badger, he's going to talk about that. And then on um, the seventh, uh, no, sorry, then I don't know, some the third, we're doing uh, something on uh, meat CSAs. So if you wanted to uh, try um, a more of a subscription-based way to sell your products, then you might want to attend that one. Yes, please do. Then uh, that website is foodanimalconcernstrust.org. Um, they have lots of awesome webinars and y'all always post them afterwards. So if you can't catch the live version, they do have the replay for you. So yes, go check that out. <laughs> Jennifer, did you have anything you wanted to plug? No, just thanks for having me on. I always enjoy reconnecting. Um, you know, I was always very passionate about my time at the Livestock Conservancy. Wish I had land for my animals. I'm trying to convince my husband to get chickens. So we'll see if, how that works <laughs> out. Um, yeah, just thanks for having me on. You know, I've, you know, I always feel if I can share any knowledge that I have with people and help them in some way, that's what I'm passionate about. So thanks for having me on. Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and share your knowledge. That was awesome. I learned some stuff. So I hope everybody else did too. I always learn something new. It's amazing. Um, and that's yeah. part of marketing. It, like it covers everything and so much and you can never know all of it. So I'm always excited to learn new things. Um, yeah. I'm just wonderful. Jennifer. Thank you 
so much. Yeah, nice really you guys. Thanks for having me and um, I hope to be on again someday if you ever need me. Take care. Absolutely. Well, Bye. yeah, and before we sign off, I'm going to say thanks to all of our members and uh, supporters. Thanks for joining the Livestock Conservancy. If you're not a member and you want to become one, uh, it can be as little as $4 a month. I think I drink more coffee every day because <laughs> <laughs> I have an addiction. Um, but if you want to learn more, you can go to our website at livestockconservancy.org. I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon and we'll be back next week. We're celebrating chickens next month. I can hardly believe it's it's March already. And uh, we'll see you then. Have a great one. Bye. Bye. <laughs>